Thank you very much. I would like first to welcome all of you who are participating in this webinar. As you know, in our recent uh, use of risk report, we have tried to examine what has just happened and how COVID has impacted workplaces worldwide in order for us to take a look at how businesses might react to the new normal. Today, for one hour, we will explore through the insights of four of our alliances lawyers, how we can build tomorrow's world, how we can build post-COVID resilient human resources practices. Effectively, uh, the COVID-19 created a phenomenon of a totally unprecedented scale since it happened so suddenly nobody was really prepared for it. Since it was global, everybody got impacted at the same time. Since it was so brutal, it incited most countries to implement a national lockdown. Both companies and employees had to act with emergency and adapt their organization to take those regulations. Support packages from central banks and the governments in developed countries have avoided the social crisis that we all feared at this time. The impacts of the fall in activity that resulted from lockdowns have been cautioned, avoiding massive layoffs, bankruptcies that some had predicted. The pandemic is not fully behind us, but hopefully we can say that the economy has already recovered. The COVID-19 pandemic and its successive way um, have profoundly changed the way many people apparent now, both their personal and professional lives over the two, um, in the last past two years. Resilience is not a new topic. But the crisis has accelerated individual and collective awareness of the need to make profound changes in our societies. It's essential for companies to integrate and support this change. The great resignation phenomenon, which was first observed in the US, is now spreading around the world. In France, for example, three days ago, Capgemini announced excellent last year, but in the same time, informed that the company has lost 25% of its consultants during the same period of time. And if we, go, if we go through the reason why the employees quit their job, clearly they are quitting because their current situation no longer is with them, meaning that the great resignation is not uh, uh, only uh, a resignation, it's more like a great questioning. The movement is massive and is not a fad. It's therefore essential that companies understand the new expectation of employees in order to respond to them in their human resources practices. The pandemic revealed or rather amplified the need of necessary changes in our human resources models. It's so interesting to note that the crisis has also been a formidable laboratory for organization, if we are honest. How many companies or managers were before the crisis reluctant to develop telework, for example? Um, we can think today that it is impossible to go back on the issue of telework. I'm not saying that telework will become the only possible way to organize, but it will no longer be possible for a company to refuse to allow it. So we need to build a, a more resilient uh, human resources practices that takes all these indicators into account, business need to find ways to build a new normal. So we will explore some of these ways through four topics that we believe are priority when it comes to human resources practice. First, we'll have a look with Ornella Patane, our partner from Toffele Tolo in Italy uh, about flexible working. After Flavia Azevedo, our partner from Ferrano Avogados in Brazil, will speak about mental health. Um, David Hopper from Lewis Silkin in the UK will discuss about upskilling. And I will conclude by myself about ESG. I'm Arnaud Tessier, partner at Capstan, France. So, Arnella. Thank you, Arnaud. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. 
Um, so coming to our topic of flexible working, as uh, each of us was uh, able to experience, uh, the pandemic forced everyone in the world to change way of working. And uh, uh, actually, it was the best driver ever to let the entire world population change in a massive and quick way the working scheme. So we passed from a traditional scheme, a working scheme from nine to five in the office to a flexible one so everywhere and at any time and uh, each of us experienced that um, of course by flexible working we mean all working arrangements which are different from the traditional one that I mentioned and this may involve so, um, part-time working remote working remote working for all the week for some days in a week or other different arrangements also high hybrid working where employees mix office and remote working. Um, in Italy, for example, flexible working is not working from home, uh, but uh, we have a legal definition of remote working as a, as a um, way of working in which uh, the employee chooses the place of work and the time when working, which is a revolution for the traditional um, definition of, of employment contract. It's Itself. Uh, this change um, was not is not an episodic answer to a contingent problem, but it represents a cultural and structural change that seems will continue for the foreseeable future. Um, indeed, in the Youth Laboratory Survey for Client for 2021, we found that 93% of companies with more than 5,000 employees, so um, big companies, the, the majority, uh, almost all of the big companies, say that they didn't expect their workforce to go back to the office full time in the near future. And on the other hand, uh, we have some studies according to which uh, employees demand for the future a more flexible scheme of working uh, to remain in the same place of work, uh, to remain with the same company, employees ask to have uh, a flexible working pattern. And uh, when they seek for a new job, the first question that they ask is to have a flexible working pattern. So uh, this is the current situation. The change is already in place. And, and the amazing thing is that the, the change regards every employee in every corner of the world. Um, but now the priority for the future uh, for all the employers is to organize the change in order to maintain the benefits that comes from it and adjust or reduce the uh, problematic aspects that it presents. Um, so the change is already in place. We need to organize the effects of the change. It was the opposite because normally uh, an employer needs time to organize a change and organize things for a change before a change. Now it was the opposite. The change is already in place and employers need to organize the effects of the change. And to do that, it is crucial uh, to analyze the benefits and the problems that arise from the flexible working. Um, as far as the benefits are concerned, uh, we can say that we have two kinds of benefits for the employer and two other kinds of benefits for the employees. Because for the employer, the good news is that uh, when uh, an employee works flexible in a flexible way, let's say, so outside the premises uh, uh, of the company, of the employer, the productivity level is um, is very good. And sometimes uh, the productivity level increases. So um, the good news for the employer is that even if the employee uh, works outside the premises in a flexible way without any schedules, any working schedule um, organized precisely or, um, or uh, in a place chosen by the employee itself, even in this situation, the productivity level level is, uh, is always good. And uh, another benefit for the employer for this kind of flexible uh, schedule is that uh, it's a key 
uh, to attract and retain talent. Um, because uh, as I told you before, um, flexible working became a key to attract and retain talent people. Um, so companies that offer flexible working as part of, of the recruitment benefits will have an advantage, an advantage over competitors who don't. Um, the benefits for the employees to have a, a flexible working schedule is that they um, experience less stress because less commuting means less stress. And of course, going to the office less means less commuting and therefore more time for themselves and for the family. Um, the other benefit that derives from this is that uh, um, the satisfaction of the employees increases and this is a benefit for the uh, for the employer as well um, and the employee on the other hand can uh, have a better work-life balance uh, indeed the employee may find it easier to manage childcare um, and other caring responsibilities and to have time uh, for the private life to have more time for the private life um, on the other side, we have not only benefits coming from uh, flexible working, but we have also uh, some problematic aspects. Um, the first of which is um, a big difficulty in building or maintaining the company culture, because you know, we, with everyone in their private zone, uh, there are fewer opportunities for networking, for collaboration with colleagues, also um, less opportunity to share knowledge, which is uh, very important um, in, a, uh, in a company. And this means also that it can be harder to build or maintain the company culture. Um, another problem is uh, um, that uh, with flexible working, you have more difficulties in monitoring uh, the employee's activity. Uh, indeed, the main question that clients are facing with fle flexible working is if and how they can monitor the employee's activity. This is a very important point. And with the change of the way of working, also the way of monitoring has changed. So it is not longer possible to monitor directly in presence um, the employee's activity. But uh, um, uh, of course, uh, an employer can monitor only remotely. And this is possible. And if this is possible, depends of course on the national legislation and on the restriction on data protection law in each country. In Italy, for example, this kind of remote monitoring is possible uh, only if it's uh, um, done through working tools, so through tools used for um, the performance of the employment contract by the employees. Um, and only if uh, a specific um, information is given to the employees on that. Uh, another problem with flexible working is also employees, employees' mental health, uh, because one of the biggest concern of the HR leaders is, is the effect of the remote working on employees' mental health. But on this specific point, Flavia will tell us more in a few minutes. Um, and as part of this, um, there is uh, um, uh, the, the, the main concern of the employer is to uh, have and, and to provide for all the employees a right of disconnection. So right of disconnection is a key. Um, is a tool uh, to use in order for the employee to be sure that during this period of time he can effectively disconnect and the employer cannot require to him to work. Another uh, adverse consequence of the uh, flexible working is also an increased risk of confidential information leaks. So this is a, an important problem. And uh, um, for this employer, of course, uh, must, uh, um, must increase 
uh, the uh, security measure to be put in place, uh, which must be tailored to remote working. Um, and in the end, uh, another problematic aspect is also when flexible working is performed from abroad. So not in the country uh, where normally um, the work is performed, but abroad. In this case, and we have a lot of examples uh, of this peculiar case, uh, in this case, you have a lot of legal problems because there is a problem of applicable law um, so when an employee works outside, uh, outside the, the, the national country, you have a problem of applicable law. You have also problems uh, um, of tax law and social security law. So uh, this is a very um, problem that you need to regulate um, in a, a peculiar way and strictly in the individual agreement for flexible working. So um, as you can see, um, a resilient new place of work must be a balance between the benefits uh, that this new kind of work presents and reduce or mitigate in the largest way possible, of course, the adverse consequences and negative aspects of it. Um, and uh, um, an important point uh, for this, of course, uh, could be a strict regulation, for example, in individual agreements like in Italy, uh, it happens. So um, now is the time for Flavia, uh, for employees' mental health. Thank you, Ornella, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here to speak to you to you a little bit uh, about, uh, as Ornella said, about the effects of all these changes that we have experienced in the past two years. Uh, I think that one of them that uh, all of us experienced in some way uh, directly even, and uh, that we have seen that the companies are dealing on a daily basis is the effects on mental health. Uh, so on mental health, uh, just for, for me to give you a little bit of uh, uh, the flavor that we have here in Brazil as to the, to the health uh, environment for employees. So the employer here in Brazil uh, has an obligation to provide a health work environment for the employees and to keep up tracking uh, the employees' uh, health condition. And this includes, of course, the mental health. So with the pandemic, it was clear to all the employers uh, that uh, we had a problem uh, with since the very beginning with the employees being concerned about the risk of contamination at the workplace and uh, with public transportation in the commuting to work, especially here in Brazil, where public transportation is in fact a, a big challenge. So the first and, uh, and uh, what we saw uh, worldwide at the times of the lockdowns, the first solution appeared to be the remote work. So everyone went on remote work. And here in Brazil, we did not exactly have a very specific legislation or a very broad uh, legislation on remote work. So uh, it, it, from, since the beginning, it, it did uh, had some challenges. So what we perceived as a challenge in the beginning, I think everyone was quite happy with the idea that came with the flexibility of uh, having more free time or at least more time with the family, uh, being able to work from home in their pajamas and flip-flops and having the flexibility that I think that was convenient at, convenient at the time. But it, it suddenly sh uh, showed that it, was, it came also with a lot of a burden and such burden was uh, actually felt uh, by the social security uh, here in Brazil. And I, I'll give you just some statistics that, we, that, I, was, that I came through when uh, preparing here to, to talk uh, to you today. And one of them is that uh, in a research from the journal Medical uh, Internet Research in, made in Brazil and in Spain, it showed the high level uh, of employees affected by mental health issues and how it increased, especially in 2020. So this research appointed that we had a level of 44% of the employees reporting some type of abuse of alcohol, more than 40% also of employees appointing some time of sleep, sleep disorder, and another bunch of workers with uh, problems that uh, went from anxiety to depression. So uh, here in Brazil, we, had, uh, we have a policy that in the first uh, 15 days 
that the employee needs to stay out of work, it's covered by the company. And starting from the 16th day, it's going to be covered as a medical license from uh, a medical leave from the Social Security authorities that are going to pay a pension to the employees. So it's just for you to have an idea from 19, from 2019 to 2020, we had an increase of 33% on the requests for sick leave only on mental health issues. So not COVID related, but on mental health issues. So uh, this of course raised a red flag for all the employers that we did have here um, a, a problem in hand and that we had to deal with that. So uh, in, trying to, in trying to see what may have caused that, uh, some of the things that uh, came up were uh, the fact that no longer employee could separate 100% when in remote work, private and professional routine. So at the same time, your workplace, it was also the, your place of leaving. And this resulted in a high level uh, of working hours. So uh, the, the working hours increased and the, the little legislation that we had on remote working says that when employee is working from home, uh, the rule is that he's not subject to working hour control. So meaning that uh, they, have, they would be, uh, there is an assumption that it's a flexible working hour. And this at the end resulted in more working hours and people complaining about working in odd hours. So very early in the morning or very late at night so that this flexibility showed not to be all the time a value for the employee, but also an element for stress. Uh, the same thing for screen exposure. I think that everyone heard of, uh, and here we had lots of uh, people discussing the Zoom fatigue, the many hours that people would be uh, in meetings and all the time in front of a screen. So uh, these, all, all this package of affecting the mental health of the employee is something that the companies are starting to address. And the way to address that here in Brazil is that companies need to update their occupational health program. So all the companies are required to have that. So the occupational health program, uh, it identifies the risks of that of any activities and how to address such, such risks. So if mental health became a risk, either for people in uh, remote work or now that we have companies coming back and resuming uh, working on site and even going on a hybrid and more flexible work system, these mental health issues have to be addressed in some way on these programs. And how to address that? So first, of course, you're going to review to include uh, mental health uh, issue uh, as a risk. And following that, you're going to see how you're going to assure employees that uh, you're concerning about this risk and you're following up on this and you're even working on prevention. So working on prevention here would be assuring the right to disconnect, would be assure breaking breaks from skin, scream hours for people in a remote work that you see them having uh, training on ergonomic uh, exercises and on the ergonomic risks that we have working from home compared to the work, uh, of course, at the office location. So companies also have to be very attentive on these programs with working hours to ensure that the fact that you have people on a more flexible work doesn't mean for them more working hours, but rather that the flexibility means that you're gonna be able to work at uh, times that are more convenient to, to your routine, but not necessarily that this means more working hours. And also a concern that employers must, must have is that uh, we, we cannot just assume that employees want to work in remote work or even in hybrid systems. So employer is not in a position to impose that, but rather uh, employers should identify employees who have uh, both the personal skills for that and that the, it's required, it's necessary for them to, for the benefit also of the business and of the company to have them in remote work. So the fact that they agree and say yes to remote work doesn't mean that they are fit for that. So a mental health assessment uh, of people who are gonna change from 100% uh, remote on, on uh, on-site work to remote work, or either the other way around. People who have been at home for more than a year now, and they have to go back to site, whether they are able to do that or not. So this assessment, it's gonna be very important for companies to, to do now. 
And uh, finally, uh, on the note here, uh, that it's, it was quite important and, and also a red flag for employers is that the burnout syndrome uh, was classified as a work-related disease in Brazil. So here, before, whenever you had uh, mental distress related to work, you, you did not have a specific code for that. Now we do have a code in the social security system uh, associating burnout as a work-related disease. What this means in practice is that uh, employers are gonna become strictly liable uh, for moral and material damages in case of an employee that becomes uh, sick with, with the burnout syndrome. Causation is not necessary here, so it's, a, it's automatic. And whenever employee is ready to come back to work, if and when, uh, it, they have a one year uh, of protection guaranteed against dismissal. So this is gonna be, uh, we're, this is definitely gonna be a challenge for employers. Uh, you have to be attentive when you have an employee di diagnosed with burnout also to see if actually uh, this is a work-related condition or if there is here something that the company should avoid uh, misclassification and uh, to avoid, of course, this, uh, this strict liability and the fact that you have someone that's going to be protected uh, from uh, dismissal during this one year then when they come back. So definitely mental health, we have, uh, I could uh, bring so many other uh, issues and topics here for, for discussion. I think I tried to give you guys a, an overview, uh, and which I believe would be helpful. And now I would believe, I think it's David, right? David's gonna. That's, that's right. Thank you very much, Flavia. So today I'm gonna to be talking about upskilling and in particular four issues that I think businesses globally and irrespective of the circumstances in your own particular country need to be focusing on. Now, they start from the pandemic itself, but I think there are also wider issues that we need to be looking forward to as people build back um, after, the, after the, the pandemic finally subsides. And I recognize I'm speaking that you know, the, the state that each country is in is still differing very, very much so. So for example, we in the UK are very much opening up with a uh, sort of a return to normal. Whereas in contrast, and whether, for example, Hong Kong is currently going through a very, very significant wave of COVID at the moment and so living under very different circumstances. So obviously what I say needs to be tailored to individual countries' own circumstances. But the first theme I want to talk about is the idea of lost education so far. The pandemic has had a profound impact on everything to do with everybody's life um, you know, in pretty much every single country of the world. But I think that's, that is absolutely true for children and young people in particular. And businesses are going to be feeling an, an impact from the pandemic for a very long time in the sense that children's education has been profoundly interrupted. I'm sure everyone will be familiar with you know, children interrupting their parents on, on Zoom calls like this, for example, over the last couple of years. And so there are going to be issues faced by businesses when they're taking on new employees, particularly young people starting their careers, as to the fact that those people will have had a very disrupted education. Now, exactly how each country will have dealt with that, so for example, school leaving certifications and so on, will vary, but businesses are gonna be confronted by the, that challenge of people will not necessarily have had the education that they would expect somebody with a particular qualification to have had. I think that also goes for on the job training, so not just sort of external qualifications from universities or colleges or schools, but also the training that people have had in their jobs. You know, when, when businesses look at CVs, the amount of experience that someone will have had and the kind of experience they'll have had over the last two and continuing years ahead um, will be different from what they might normally expect. And so that, again, is something that businesses need to be factoring in. And I think that's, that's true absolutely in the context of things such as apprentices. So often people will do an apprenticeship, um, so learning a particular trade over a particular number of years. Often that would have been fundamentally interrupted by what we've seen with the pandemic. So people are going to be um, less well-trained than you might normally expect them to be after a particular amount of time in work to date. I think in a, in a, in a more softer sense as well, people will have fallen behind in their training. And you know, as a lawyer, I've seen this in particular. Um, one of the real challenges that we face, and I'm sure many people on the call will have had similar issues in their own industry, has been how people early on, their, on in their careers learn. You know, a lot of, a lot of learning is about what we call osmosis. So sitting around people, hearing how other people are doing things. And I think the fact that everyone's become very geographically separated by working from home um, has really impacted on the, on the level of experience that younger people have. And I think businesses to start with almost need to be auditing 
what the impact of the last few years, you know, when you do get to that point of being able to go back to a normal world, whatever that will look like, what has been lost and what strategies do you need to put in place? I think a lot of, you know, a, a real sense of, you know, everyone has done what they can to get through the last couple of years, but actually a, a strategic review will be very important for many businesses to identify those gaps and go, where do we need to fill in um, to make sure that in the longer term we're protected? That very much ties in with what is the new normal that the business is trying to move towards. We've heard about you know, working from home strategies and so on already today. And you know, I think there, there is an inevitability that people will not go, to back, go back to exactly how they were working um, in around February or March of 2020 when the pandemic hit. But I think we can't only think about this in the sense of the pandemic and businesses that are planning for the future need to have a, 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 an eye on much wider strategic issues as well. And one of the things that really jumps out at me is the idea of automation um, and, for example, artificial intelligence as well. You know, if you look at a country like the United States, it's estimated there are something like three million people who are working driving vehicles in the United States at the moment. Now, as we have things like driverless cars, driverless lorries, that's going to pose all kinds of challenges for businesses. First of all, in terms of making that kind of technology work, but what it then does with its human capital and many businesses will have invested a lot in their employees to date. And I'm going to come on um, to the benefits of retaining employees in a moment. But they need to be thinking about what are we going to do with our employees if, if their current roles are no longer available? How do we need to plan ahead to reskill people so that as an organization, we don't lose that institutional knowledge that those people can currently bring to their job? And I think that's particularly important because we no longer live in a world where there is a job for life. You know, many you know, years ago, um, you know, our parents' generations, they would have potentially gone into a job thinking, I will never move. Whereas that world is, is broadly over. Of course, there are some, some industries and some countries where that might still exist. But increasingly, people are going to have a number of careers, never mind just working at one company, but possibly even a number of careers during the course of their working life. And so businesses need to be thinking about how do we retain people so that we don't lose people that we've invested in to go off to either competitors or other, other industries altogether. And I think that really sort of ties in with why reviewing skills is really a win-win for employers. You know, first of all, and in some ways the most importantly, if you offer employees or your workers or your workforce um, opportunities to improve, um, to upskill them in whatever it is that they do, they're likely to be more happy in what they do and therefore they're less likely to leave you. And from a really selfish perspective, from the, from the business's um, point of view, that you know, saves on hiring costs, you know, people turnover, um, you know, annual turnover within businesses is a huge expense, as, as everyone will be aware. The hiring process is long, it's costly, it's time intensive. Um, and if you can avoid doing it altogether, then, then you know, that, that can only be a benefit for the business. And I think that that really applies in the moment. We've already um, heard about sort of concepts of the great resignation. Um, the, the idea of retaining people at the moment as we face difficult economic circumstances um, you know, inflation is now back, for want of a way of putting it, um, and we're seeing that across a number of countries at the moment dealing with, with record high inflation that hasn't been seen for years. And, you know, the invasion of Russia, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine this morning has you know, sent oil prices to, 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 to new high levels as well. So I think being able to retain people and being able to give that offer in terms of skills training, even if you can't afford um, you know, financial pay increases, is going to be something that people are looking at. I think what's then really important to think is your strategies for doing, um, for doing this and implementing this. And I've already touched on the idea of doing an audit so that you can make sure that you know what the problem is that you're trying to address to start with. But I think you can then think about working creatively and, and cost effectively as well, because I'm, I'm conscious that obviously cost is something that many businesses are struggling with as they're seeking to recover from the pandemic. So for example, in the UK, we've got something called the apprenticeship levy which is a, a government funded scheme um, funded through a, a special tax on employers, which makes money available for businesses that want to train their staff and upskill their staff. So it's possible there'll be state funded schemes um, in your own country. Often employees will have statutory rights or a legal right um, to training. So for example, in the UK, employees have the right to request time off. Now businesses you know, could be encouraged to be proactive about this, to encourage employees to think about what training it is they need rather than training simply being led by business managers. Likewise, if you're going to be providing training, especially if you're going to be funding training from your employees, you need to be thinking about what kind of contractual protections you, you can put in place for yourself. Now, again, this will obviously be country by country specific, 
but often you can put in place contractual protection so that if you fund somebody to go on a particular training course, then if they leave the business within a certain period of time, the employee would have to pay back a percentage of the cost that you've incurred. Obviously for um, sort of day-to-day -day training, that may not be so important, but if you're funding people to go off and do, for example, an MBA uh, for some of your senior managers, you clearly want to make sure that you keep the benefit of the education that they've had. And then finally, um, as a comment from someone who does a lot of work with trade unions, I'd also say just bear in mind working with social partners. You know, the trade unions, works councils, you know, are very alive to these issues and they often want to be a very constructive influence in the workplace. And so I think this is really a case of engaging with your trade unions proactively about this can help you develop these strategies and more important also implement these strategies in a way that's going to win buying from your workforce. So there's just a few ideas of, of some strategies uh, for dealing with upskilling is a massive challenge at the moment so that every business is going to go through its own particular way. But given the time today, I'm now going to pass over to Arno. Thank you, Didier. Uh, as a consequence of the crisis, I think that um, one of the UGC we will, we will, we will have is about the, the, the challenge of meaning at work now. Effectively, the, the, the COVID crisis has led many employees to, to reconsider their role in society. A lot of them have started more taking into consideration the social impacts of their job when building their career. Many are now asking themselves uh, the following question, does my job have a positive impact on society? What is new? That this no longer only concerns young people from the famous Generation Z. We know that this generation was more than before um, really concerned about measuring the usefulness, purpose of work, their contribution to the company and to, to, to the society. The crisis has acted as a revelation for many. And from now on, we can say that uh, a job that lacks meaning becomes a reason in itself to leave the company. Let's take a, a closer look at the phenomenon of the great resignation David told us a few minutes about. In the US, it is estimated that nearly 40 million people have resigned in 2021, and nearly half of did so even though they didn't have find a job already. It means that uh, we can ask about the motivation and what are the main motivations beyond this great resignation? When asked, the top reasons cited by employees are in order of priority, one, to find better working conditions, two, a better work-life balance, three, to give meaning to their work. So in my opinion, what is interesting to note is that less than one in 10 employees say they are leaving their job for financial reasons. It is true that a change of position is often uh, accompanied by a salary increase, of course, but uh, uh, we can, however, um, highlight that now uh, a raise is no longer, no longer the, the, the main reason why uh, an employee is leaving. Uh, many employees prefer to earn less, but to have a job in which they feel more fulfilled. Employees therefore want to be able to, I think, find meaning in their work, understand the purpose of the job, understand and measure the positive impact of their job in society. Beyond that, employees are increasingly careful to check whether the company's values are compatible with their own. Uh, companies that are not able to integrate uh, this evolution risk, uh, in my opinion, suffering the impact of many departures, of course, but also not being attractive enough to attract new, new, new talent. Companies must therefore redesign their human resources policies to tackle this issue of meaning at work. And then I think that um, human resources policies can be redesigned around the ESG criteria. E for environmental, S for social, and G for governance, as you know. And as people see the values of their employer as an extension of their own values and brand, organizations will need to promote strong ESG credential to attract and retain the best people. 
we know that uh, with ESG, we have to evaluate how sustainable development and long-term issues are taken into consideration in the strategy of the company. These are extra financial criteria that are very different from the usual financial standards we are familiar with, which are such as profitability, share price, or gross prospects, etc. We know, we know now that uh, investors are incorporating ESG consideration in their investment decisions, recognizing the positive impact it can have on productivity, growth, and reduce risk and cost. Employees are increasingly taking these indicators into account too when they are choosing the companies in which they want to, to, to work or, or, or continue working. From a human resources point of view, uh, I think that the adoption of ESG criteria by the company allows employees to consider whether the company's trajectory is in line or not with their own values. This ESG criteria can then be applied to the entire human resources policy and, for example, taken into account in the remuneration policy during um, the inclusion in the evaluation policy. Uh, we can imagine a training program designed to support the company's progress in ESG matters and so on. Employees are then directly um, involved in the company's ESG strategy and contribute to the positive impact it brings, which makes it rewarding and meaningful. Um, we can uh, note that in the last few years, new legal forms have been developed to integrate ESG objectives more concretely. These are uh, for profit entities, but which take into account, which, which take into account societal and environmental objectives in their governance and management structure. The company is therefore no longer governed solely in the interest of shareholders, but with regard to general interest objectives, which are defined and whose achievement is audited and measured. Some examples in the US, there are benefit corporations, the, the famous big corporations. Uh, in Italy, uh, a law of December 28, uh, 2015 created, uh, you know it, Ornella, uh, the Societa Benefit. In France, we have the Law Pact in 2019. The law uh, enshrined the, the status of mission-based company. This involves that a company publicly affirms its raison d'être, as well as one of more, more social and environmental objectives that it sets out to pursue along the normal running of its business. Being a mission-driven company involves setting a purpose, defining social and environmental objectives to be achieved within the framework of the mission, and monitoring the execution of the mission by a, a, a ad hoc body. In a recent communication, the, the, the French Secretary of State of the Economy stated that French companies that do not transform themselves into mission-based companies will have difficulties recruiting in the coming years. They will lose in as a competitor to attract talents. A global dynamic is therefore underway and it will continue to gain momentum. We can note the resolution of the European Parliament adopted in December, last December, on sustainable corporate governance. Sorry. It is stated that when it comes to business, a sustainability-based approach implies that companies must take due account of societal and environmental concerns. And the EU Parliament calls on the Commission to rapidly present new texts affirming stronger obligations for companies on these issues. And you have certainly seen yesterday a project of new directive concerning the, 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 those topics, meaning that uh, it's something really going ahead. Um, now to conclude, we, we, we have a quick look on what control to, to, to make um, ESG more, more, more efficient. 
NGOs regularly campaigns against companies who practices appear to violate ESG commitments, an MGM strategy, of course. But we can highlight the fact that now employee representatives are increasingly involved. Actions are now being undertaken by trade unions, for example, against company. For example, in recent years, actions in violation of OECD guidelines um, has been developing. Um, just remember that 48 uh, countries around the world adhere to these guidelines, uh, which set requirements in ESG matters for um, multinational companies. Um, in the event of uh, a violation, an alleged violation, it is possible then to initiate a procedure. And for example, it has been done against uh, by unions against uh, the, the, the French company Teleperformance um, for viol violations in 10 countries, Colombia, France, Philippines, Portugal, U USA, UK, etc. Uh, and the unions challenged the fact that Teleperformance was violating the rights of workers to a safe workplace during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we have some actions taken into account by the unions. And we know that it's clear that um, we can say that the, the, the employee representatives are called upon to play an increasingly important uh, watchdog, watchdog role uh, in monitoring uh, the company's ESG action. Uh, a last illustration of that can be um, under a, a, a look at the French example in the fight against global warming, because you, you you probably know that uh, there is a new law in uh, August 2021, which requires from companies uh, to give information to the works committee on the environmental consequences of the company's activity, allowing it to monitor on a regular basis the company's policies and actual impacts and to keep employees informed. So it means the importance of the the, 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 the situation in France. And more than that, the Works Committee will be informed and consulted before the adoption of any important project by the employer. It is, it is the, the, the normal law. When there is a, an important project, the employer has to inform and consult his Works Committee. And now he has to justify having taken, taken into account the environmental impacts of its actions. So, the employer is not required to choice the options with, with the smallest uh, environmental footprint. Nevertheless, it means that the employer must demonstrate and justify having taken into account the um, environmental consequences of the project presented. The, the, says, uh, the, the, the works committee does not have um, a right of veto. The employer can override the opinion of the CEC of the Works Committee, the French Works Committee, but it will be then up to him to take um, into account the risk of hostility that may arise from his uh, pro ESG employees, uh, uh, of course. So um, I will have just a few words as a conclusion of um, our four uh, uh, points. Um, it's sort of a, my conclusion is a sort of a word given to the human resources people. Uh, I, I would say it's made, it has been made clear that the COVID crisis has placed human resources at the center of many issues, as you have uh, heard. During the crisis, the role of human resources everywhere in the world has been both obvious and essential. Uh, it has been a glue uh, that held the employees together, of course. They have been involved on every issue, minor and major one. The, the role of uh, human resources will be just uh, as decisive when it comes to helping companies build a, a, a resilient model. It will be necessary to create new synergies. Um, as you have heard about uh, Ornella and Flavia, uh, it will be very important to reconcile telework and mental health. How to reconcile, to, to reconcile uh, those two issues? As Flavia reminded us, 
employees nowadays are strongly expecting to be able to work remotely. Telework offer many positive as aspects, of course, um, but telework also creates new risk, uh, risk of isolation, of addiction to work, uh, of loss of reference. The place of working is confused with the place of living. Um, the employer cannot generalize telework without putting in place appropriate measures to prevent this risk. And as Ornella mentioned, the companies must think about setting up a charter to regulate the use of telework, setting rules and limitations. We have to seek and to, to, to think about it, to see how to, to, to organize it within the, co the company um, to mitigate the, 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 the mental health risk in particular. And when we, we, we talk about the risk to, 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 to disconnect, we spontaneously think that it is about protecting the employees against the organization's abuses. Some, of, some can say that. But in reality, the right to disconnect protects employees against themselves and the difficulties they may have to self-regulate. It's also necessary to train managers to supervise their, their teams in a telework situation. Uh, the manager as an agent of change must compensate for the, the, the physical distance created by remote in order to avoid isolation and uncertainty and to maintain loyalty, I think. And David reminded us of the importance of training and the levers we can, that, that we can mobilize. Um, as telework becomes more widespread, new issues will arise. And for example, and to conclude, we can say how to ensure that employees will remain loyal to the company when some of them will rarely be on premises. Is there not a risk of creating mercenary employees because they are not really uh, in the, in the, in, within the company? So the implementation of a, a, an HR policy will be essential to tackle these issues. We need to reinvent the corporate culture to adapt it to a, a more fragmented work group. Um, it's tomorrow, in tomorrow's world, I think that uh, human resources will be essential to help organization to, to build a, a resilient model. So I, I think that we, we can have now the, the, the Q&A session. We'll have a look on the, the question. And per, perhaps, uh, David, uh, one interesting question for you. Um, are you aware of any legislative proposal to improve workers' rights to, to upskilling? I'm sorry, I just come off, off mute there on it. Uh, yes, I am actually. Yeah, the European Commission is looking at something. So again, you know, recognizing we obviously got a global audience today, and so we're talking about 27 countries within the EU. But one of the things the European Commission is looking at is the idea of what are called individual learning accounts. And I think these are really interesting because I, I've talked about how employers can approach things um, for their own staff. But what the European Commission also wants to do is, is to broaden this concept to everybody in the population. So it's something that would apply for you whether or not you're in work. So it also catches those looking to re-enter the workforce, perhaps after time out, looking, for fa looking after family, um, or those who have been perhaps in the long-term unemployed category. And what it's really doing is trying to make sure that all the, all the building blocks are in place for employees or for individuals to make things as easy as possible. So it would involve each country producing lists of uh, effectively approved training providers. So that there's an easy, easy way for people to know where to go for training, making sure that training is also certified and accredited, um, including even sort of yeah, quite small amounts of training through what, what the European Commission would call sort of micro credentials. It would also be linked to giving people career guidance. So I've already talked about how people might have you know, a range of careers during the course of their lifetime. So there could be guidance for individuals as they're looking to move from one career maybe to the next career. And it would, it would be a way to validate the skills that they have. So it's a, it's, a, it's a way for the employee to be able to demonstrate, you know, these are the skills that I can bring to you when I'm moving to my new, employee, in my new employer. And I think finally, just why it's, why it's really interesting is it's one thing that, the European Commission is encouraging to the member states of each country within the European Union to accompany this with things such as paid training leave and also for the governments to work with the social partners, so with business, with the trade unions, to put this whole framework into place. So it's designed to, to sort of a catch all of everything within society to encourage everybody who wants to be productive in the world of work.
to be so irrespective of their background and the circumstances they're currently in and not dependent upon having a good employer. Thank, thank you, David. Um, Ornella, I think uh, we have a question for you. Um, is it necessary to have a written agreement regulating flexible working? Yeah, in Italy, yes, it is. Uh, it's about an individual agreement. Uh, instead, there is no need for a collective bargaining agreement to have in place a, um, a flexible working uh, pattern. And this is a very important point. Uh, so it's necessary an individual agreement, even if during the emergency period that is going to end uh, at the end of March, um, it was not uh, necessary to have it in place uh, just to simplify uh, the, um, uh, the, the way of working uh, flexible, uh, even without an individual agreement. But uh, from our point of view, it is always uh, better to have it in place, to have an individual agreement to regulate every aspect of uh, flexible working, uh, just to avoid the um, problematic aspects that we uh, told uh, about um, before. Uh, so to regulate, for example, working hours, the right to disconnect, um, uh, the monitoring of the employee's activity when they are uh, outside the premises of the company. Uh, so it is much, much better to have it in place even during the emergency period. And in any case, it is necessary to have it in place after the emergency period. So after um, March 2022, uh, starting from April 2022. Thank you, Anela. Thank you. Um, question for you, Flavia, I think so. Um, to what extent and in which form the employer may be held liable for the employee's mental disorder and how is it possible to mitigate it? Well, uh, I think that uh, because uh, the employer is, in, is liable generally to, for the work environment where the employee is, uh, and consequently, for whatever uh, health issues come out of that environment, I would, uh, I would say that the best way to risk it is to face it that mental health became a, a risk, a work-related risk. And if we treat so, we are going to focus on improving uh, whatever programs that the company have to be attentive of signs of mental health issues. So if you, if you see employees are um, working too much, are uh, just with low level of energy and this type of thing that you already uh, have not only the possibility to identify it since the beginning, but also uh, that you have programs in place to take care of that. I think that uh, the right to disconnect comes came in certain way in, in the speech of all of us here. Uh, it's an important thing. Uh, looking uh, also at working hours control uh, if the employee is not able to, to control it uh, by himself, as I know was just mentioning, the uh, employer must have the tools uh, to do that so that you, that you avoid uh, situations in which the stress goes too high or burnout. Or on the other hand, also uh, ensure that you don't have the levels of control that it's just too much on the employee that feels like a pressure. So uh, supervisors uh, that are not used to have remote work uh, situation and they start just demanding or asking employees to be available uh, in, a, in a way that may be too, too intense or too stressful and in, in, to the extent that can be understood by someone by a harassment situation, for example. So I think that uh, I identify mental risk uh, as what it is today for us, a, a potential work-related disease. Make sure that you have the tools to identify uh, since the beginning when an employee has uh, symptoms or anything that needs to be treated and make sure that you have the right programs in place to uh, mitigate the risk of people actually evolving this type of diseases. Thank you very much, Flavia. So I think it's time. So it's time for me to, to thank you for your contributions. 